Hi, this is Professor K. Han Lust with another lecture in History 1301, United States History 2, 1877. Today we're going to be on Lecture 17, The Impending Crisis. Uh, we are really in the home stretch. These next uh, three lectures are it for the remainder of the semester, and we're really kind of getting into with the quote unquote impending crisis, uh, the sort of uh, ending point. Uh, of History 1301, but the thing that's the springboard for virtually all of History 1302. Uh, so on some level, I think these last three lectures uh, are the most important uh, of the lectures. Now, we're going to start today with something that I have kind of hinted at and I mentioned in passing in a previous class, the slave power conspiracy. Beginning in the, 18, the late 1840s and heading into the 1850s, a lot of Americans started uh, moving away from conspiracies that were about things like a papal conspiracy or a conspiracy of people who were trying to limit access uh, to government, limit access to business like the Whigs had been talking about or, or their precursors, the anti-Masons. Instead, what this group of conspirators were talking about was a conspiracy built around slaveholding. And it was, pro it was put out there by an author named John Smith Dye, uh, who published a book called The Adder's Den, or Secrets of the Great Conspiracy to Overthrow Liberty in America. Now, what he argued, what Dye argued in this, with this slave power conspiracy of his, was that from the very beginning of American history, dating back to the constitutional era, people who owned slaves had been engaged in a massive conspiracy to make sure that they always controlled the government and that those who opposed them, in particular those who would oppose slavery, would not be able to do anything to stop them. So, for example, Dye argued that people who were pro-slavery entrenched slavery in the Constitution. He argued that in 1819, in 1837, and indeed later on in 1857, he's going to argue that slaveholders created these massive economic crises in order to sabotage the northern economy. He argued that slaveholding was, uh, some, was something that was used to take Native American lands away from them, so Indian removal was, was intricately connected uh, with the issue of uh, Indian removal. He said that slaveholders fomented rebellion and revolution in Texas and wars with Mexico in order to expand the empire for the slave-holding South. Now, these things are things that when we talked about them in class, I mentioned to you that there is an actual connection between a lot of this stuff. So it's not like this was a hard sell for die when it came to convincing people that this is what's going on. What's controversial about all of this is that Dye said this is the conspiracy, this is what they've been engaged in doing, but the controversial part is how they actually got their way. He argued that slaveholders used assassination and violence as a tool to get their way for all of this. Uh, for example, in 1835, uh, these slave power conspiracy advocates held that John C. Calhoun had encouraged a man to kill the president of the United States, Andrew Jackson, because Calhoun and Jackson didn't see eye to eye on the issue of nullification, as we've already discussed in this class. So they argued that John C. Calhoun hired this crazy guy to go out and try to kill Jackson. In 1841, he argued, the slave power, quote unquote, poisoned William Henry Harrison. Remember, William Henry Harrison opposed the annexation of Texas, not because he didn't like Texas, but because he believed it would be divisive to the Whig Party. So he was uh, he was bumped off, essentially, was the argument. Uh, he was killed with arsenic poisoning 30 days into office. In 1850, uh, 1850 they argued, uh, Zachary Taylor, the uh, again, president of the United States, who had been a slaveholder and, generally speaking, supported slaveholder ideas, well, Dye argues that that slave power poisoned him with arsenic to get their way. Uh, we also see uh, 
that on at least two other separate occasions, again, according to Dai, I'm not telling you that this is quote-unquote historical fact. I'm suggesting to you that this is according to Dai. On two separate occasions, they used attempted, the slave power, quote-unquote, used attempted assassinations uh, as a way to intimidate presidents. Uh, Franklin Pierce, for example, his railroad car uh, was derailed while he was on his way to his inauguration in 1853. While the president-elect himself survived, his son was actually decapitated, and Pierce was largely ineffective as a president, uh, wound up sinking, as many probably would, uh, into a deep depression over this stuff, uh, over the death of his son. Uh, and many argued, well, it's because the Southern slaveholding conspirators had bumped off his kid to try to prove to him that he needed to play ball with them. In 1857, President-elect James Buchanan, uh, a Democrat who was generally speaking uh, pro-slaveholder, uh, he had had his uh, inauguration, and at the uh, inaugural, uh, one of the post-inaugural events, uh, a number of politicians met to celebrate this, and Buchanan and several people got poisoned via arsenic. The, uh, the story goes, the conspiracy goes, that the Northerners were, using, were drinking coffee after dinner while Southerners were drinking tea, and because the two drinks used a different type of sugar— lump sugar versus granular sugar, it was easier to poison one group of uh, politicians over the other one. So uh, a number of politicians got sick, and Buchanan and those northern politicians got the message, don't mess around with these southern slaveholders. Now, again, that's the conspiracy. The reality is, is that there's no evidence to support any of this stuff. Now, some Things, quote unquote, did happen. There was an attempt to kill Andrew Jackson, and Andrew Jackson, uh, as uh, uh, as it turns out, uh, Jackson very nearly beat the attempted assassin to death uh, in the process of it. But there's nothing credible that ever linked John C. Calhoun with this attempt to assassinate the president. William Henry Harrison, as you should remember well, died 30 days into office, but the symptoms of his death appeared to be more likely uh, the ca the uh, uh, caused by pneumonia, not arsenic poisoning. Zachary Taylor, I mentioned that the uh, stories about his uh, death uh, were st stuck around forever, uh, that he had been poisoned by arsenic. Uh, however, his family, tired of all of these rumors and tired of all of the potential innuendo about all of this, his descendants ordered that his body be exhumed so that it could be examined to find once and for all, was he poisoned or did he die of something else? And that 1991 examination determined that Taylor had no poison in his body, that his uh, death was the result of cholera, period. Uh, and then as far as the uh, train derailments and all of this stuff, while Franklin Pierce's son did actually die caught, uh, courtesy of a of a railroad car derailment, there's no evidence that suggested foul play in it, uh, nor was there any evidence suggesting the sugar plot uh, that uh, that poisoned several uh, northern politicians. So remember, first of all, conspiracy theories abound throughout all of history. But secondly, remember, as I told you during the Revolutionary War era, as I told you during the anti-Masonic conspiracies, as I'm going to tell you now, the reason conspiracy theories take hold is because they are easier, especially if there's a, fight, a slight or thin shred of credibility to them, conspiracy theories are easier to buy into than looking for deeper root causes. Uh, they People don't like the deeper root causes of things. They like the easy, simple explanation. Now, also, before we go on into what's happening in the United States, creating this impending crisis, it's worth taking a look again at what's going on in the rest of the world during this period. Because, as I've mentioned to you also, we like to think of the United States as a country whose history happens in a vacuum. It happens in isolation. Uh, 
But there's a lot going on in the world during this period, a lot that the United States is involved with. And off the just kind of, again, off the cuff, if we look at it, it looks like none of this stuff is related, but it is actually uh, related to the things that are happening uh, in the United States as we head into the Civil War era. And one of these things uh, is the so-called Opium War in China. Now, the Opium War that occurs in China is a very odd thing that's happening in the mid-semester of the, 19, or the mid uh, part of the 19th century. There are very few circumstances in history where the people who lose actually name the war. Uh, but one of those circumstances is the so-called Opium War. The Chinese government opposed what was going on with opium. The Chinese government is going to lose, quote-unquote, during the Opium War. And yet they're going to be the ones who choose the name for what's happening. Now, what's going on with this Opium War is that northern uh, traders, uh, people from the United States north, uh, were looking for areas of the of the globe to get involved in trade. Uh, they wanted to trade in China for the same reason Europeans wanted to trade in China back in the 1500s and 1600s, as we talked about earlier. And the problem was, just like in that period, the United States wasn't really manufacturing stuff that the Chinese wanted. The Chinese, again, did not care about tobacco. They didn't care about cotton. They couldn't have cared less about rice or indigo or any of this other stuff. They wanted gold. They wanted silver. They wanted hard currency. Uh, they were interested in exotic things like spices and silks. And the United States didn't have this. What the West truly wanted during this period was to find a commodity that China would be willing to trade. And if they weren't going to be willing to trade it, it was something that was going to have to be forced on to the Chinese. So uh, what winds up being chosen as the uh, as the issue here, or as the commodity, is opium. And it winds up being dumped into uh, China in just incredibly and increasingly large numbers. And this winds up causing a huge problem in China. First of all, as I mentioned in the earliest parts of the semester, when we talked about China as a potential challenger to uh, Western Europe uh, for global domination, that, sh that ship kind of sails in the 15th century. But as I mentioned, it's really not until the 19th century that China really starts to decline quickly. And it's because of the Opium War. So this ends any chance the Opium War does, ends any chance that China is going to rebound and become uh, a particularly important power again. And in fact, what it also does is begins literally a century of humiliation at the hands of the West onto China. This is something that's beginning in the 1840s and will not be resolved until nearly 1950, uh, as far as who's in control of China. Obviously, with the use of opium, the West is going to impose an, an addictive drug on the Chinese. When the war is over, the Opium War itself, when it's over, uh, there's going to be an unequal treaty imposed on China. And then, as the sort of last straw, if you will, Great Britain is going to take Hong Kong as a colony. They're going to take it away from China and create a separate Western enclave uh, in uh, in China by taking co Hong Kong as a colony. Now, there was one company, an American company, that made out incredibly well uh, in all of this stuff. Uh, and this was a company called Russell and Company that initially traded silk and tea. They were kind of the leaders in the Opium War. They were the ones who uh, implemented uh, this trade in opium. And the reason was, again, uh, China wanted gold and silver. And courtesy of the things that are going on with the Panic of 1837, as you should recall, the United States supply of gold had gone down because the government was taking it in. They were removing different denominations of currency from uh, circulation. They were requiring that lands be paid for in quote unquote hard currency or specie. So it's simply not out there. And the only way to really trade with China was to find a new source of gold, which does not happen, as you should well recall, until 1849, or get China to accept something else so that we're not constantly uh, 
depleting gold and silver. And the a, an agent for Russell and Company came up with the answer. The answer was to import opium from Asia Minor. And the pioneer in this was a trader, an agent for Russell and Company named Warren De, uh, Delano. Warren Delano came in. He made agreements with various uh, various local officials to trade opium. The emperor in China realized very quickly how bad opium was for his people uh, and moved to ban opium. But unlike in the 15th century, when we talked about the empire, uh, the emperor having this sort of uh, unlimited, undisputed power, Warren Delano simply goes around the emperor and bribes local officials to keep the trade going. And local officials realize they can make more money by defying the emperor than by upholding his rules and upholding his laws. So ultimately, the emperor kind of loses face, loses power as a result of all of this. And Warren Delano, as agent for Russell and Company, winds up making an unbelievable fortune in doing this. So much so that Warren Delano retires in his 40s, moves to New York, becomes one of the most prominent families, uh, the head of one of the most prominent families in New York, and marries his daughter off to one of his neighbors, a man named Roosevelt, and Warren Delano's child, his daughter, and the daughter, the son of this Roosevelt wind up having a son named Franklin Delano Roosevelt. So the Roosevelt family is, is intimately connected with the Delanos and their wealth derives from this uh, opium trade. Uh, Roosevelt actually worked for Delano before uh, all of this stuff as well. So there's a, a connection here uh, that creates this incredible wealth and creates this political uh, condition, uh, this political uh, family here. Now, China, as I mentioned, their emperor does not like this. He wants to stop this. And like modern America, he creates a quote unquote war on drugs, a war on opium. And it's not much different uh, than what we do in the modern world. For example, the ships of Russell and Sons Company would come in, they would be boarded by Chinese forces, the opium would be dumped into the ocean. But because these Chinese uh, officials, were boarding American vessels and destroying the cargo of American merchants, the United States decided this was a pretext for war. And other Western countries decided the same thing, that this was a pretext for war. So various Western countries, including the United States, send forces into China with the goal of restoring order and opening their ports. Now, there's never an official war declared, so I don't want to give you the wrong idea here. Uh, and what the United States does, in addition to sending lots of, uh, in, in addition to sending some naval forces, what they also do is they send in hundreds of missionaries into China, thinking that by sending these missionaries in, they can change Chinese society and get it to be more open. Uh, to American and Western ideals. Regardless of how it's being done and regardless of what countries are actually involved in this quote-unquote war, uh, China winds up becoming flooded with opium as a consequence of all of this. Now, this opium war, as it turns out, winds up uh, evolving into a civil war in China. And this civil war uh, was called the Taiping Rebellion. This Taiping Rebellion lasted from 1851 to 1864. So it takes on the period right after the uh, the United States' war with Mexico, and it winds up stretching well into our own civil war. So this is an incredibly important cycle that's going on uh, in China. Uh, and as far as death toll, this nearly 15-year-long war winds up costing China 20 million lives in the process. And the question in all of this stuff, uh, the big issue, is who's going to be in control of China? Will Westerners be in control of China, or will the Chinese themselves be in control, depending on whether it's, you know, whether it's uh, the people who are involved in the Taiping Rebellion, whether it's the emperor, whether it's some other force, 
The question is, who will be in charge in China? Now, the Taiping Rebellion itself uh, was led by a sort of self-styled prophet of sorts named Hong Shi Quan. Uh, and Taiping actually means, quote, the great peace. And uh, Hong Shi Quan was convinced that he was the son of Jesus Christ. He wasn't the son of God. He wasn't Jesus himself. He was convinced that he was the reincarnated son of of Jesus Christ. And as the government of China was collapsing all around him, Hong Shi Quan wound up attracting 5 million people, uh, mostly peasants, uh, but 5 million people is 5 million people. It was a big deal to have this many people behind him. These people had previously been Buddhists, but they were attracted to Hong Shi Quan, not because of his message of, of Jesus or anything. They were convinced that they should follow him because what he was doing was saying we do not favor Western control. China should be in control of Chinese people. So these people who are Buddhist peasants, they don't care one iota about religion. They care about, for lack of a better word, nationalism. Now, Hong Shi Quan and his followers wound up taking control of large parts of China. And they set up, essentially, a theocracy throughout China. They uh, established this new uh, kingdom that is called, quote-unquote, the Heavenly Kingdom. And in the process of doing this, this theocracy, this, this theocracy it's easy for me to say, prohibited far more than just opium use. It prohibited gambling. It prohibited tobacco use. It prohibited alcohol use. Obviously, it prohibited opium use. But it also did a number of things that were, even by American standards, these are incredibly radical for the era. It abolished things like foot binding amongst, among women. It abolished slavery within China. It abolished polygamy within China. It abolished uh, prostitution within China. Hong Shi Quan believed in equality of the sexes, so, uh, so much so that he actually named a number of women as officers within his military. So uh, he established property-owning rights for women within uh, within this quote-unquote heavenly kingdom. Uh, but Hong Shi Quan wound up taking a step that was too far for many people. What Hong Shi Quan wound up doing that cost him support uh, and caused uh, others within China to sort of gather around opposing him was that he attempted to redistribute land. He attempted to take land from the wealthy and start redistributing it so that everyone had access to land ownership. So the Taiping Rebellion winds up being crushed, but it was, but it was emblematic of this division uh, within, soci within Chinese society, and it made China uh, essentially fall uh, to Western control. So Western domination is the end result of this Taiping Rebellion that Hong Shi Quan uh, had created. So it's important to recognize that in addition to everything that's happening in the United States, there's stuff going on elsewhere in the world that is equally important and that the United States is involved in. Uh, now, as far as how we see this connected to the United States, obviously there is a massive growth in the local economy or the global economy. That's one thing. Global economics is more important than ever by the time we head into the 1850s. And young men are becoming incredibly wealthy. They're making fortunes in global trade. Guys like Warren Delano uh, and his uh, and his associates like James Roosevelt, they are not abnormal during this period. There are lots of young men like them doing this exact same thing. Now, that's what's happening from a global perspective. Let's look at the effect that this has in the United States. What's happening in the United States is a process that I've talked about where the United States was moving in two separate directions. And what I keep talking about is, is it moving in such different directions that this gap here is constantly widening between the two, amongst the two sides, okay? So by the time we get to the 1850s, we see a U.S. that is virtually split in half. We've got one side, the North, that is heavily industrialized, 
it's becoming and uh, becoming more and more urbanized. Uh, people are concentrating in the nation's cities. They're increasingly involved in international trade. And the basis for the entire society is free or wage labor. Now, remember, free doesn't mean that the labor works for free. Free means the laborer is free to take their work to the highest bidder. So if you don't like working in factory A, if factory B comes along and offers you twice the money to work there, you are free to take yourself to that place and go work for them. Now that's the North. The South rests on slave labor. The entire focus of Southern society is the production of raw materials, cotton, sugar, tobacco, rice, uh, indigo, okay, for the entire economy. Now, what we find out here, what sociologists find out as they look backward at places like the South and the North and all of this sort of stuff, is that the kind of economy a region has, a region has, excuse me, the kind of economy that a region has shapes its values. Now, today, we all live in a very highly individualistic world. People are convinced that whether you're rich or poor depends largely on your own efforts. Now, there have been, uh, especially in the last several weeks uh, and months leading up to uh, uh, August of 2020, in those last several weeks and months, we've seen more and more people challenging that. But by and large, most people still believe that whether you fail or succeed, is up to you. If you work hard, if you pursue what is in your own economic self-interest, if you do what's best for you, then you will succeed. Now, this type of a world requires mobility. It requires that you be able to move from place to place. It means that you have to do and move what's where it's best for you to do that. Now, that type of individual culture already exists in the North by the 1820s and is blooming heading into the 1850s. People in that society believed that they were the ones who were devoted to progress. They had faith that technology was good, that cities were good, that the growth of industry and industrial pursuits, all of these are good things. People in the South, though, had a different outlook. They had a different economy, and as a result, a different set of values. They were based on slave agriculture, as I've pointed out. Cities are bad in this circumstance. Industrialization is bad. Immigration is bad. Because what the South wanted was a stable hierarchy. They wanted to be able to look at society and say, we can count on these people at the top, these people just below them, these people in the middle, people directly below them, and then again, at the lowest possible level, enslaved people. So they want a hierarchy that creates stability. And when they look at all of these other things, when they look at urbanization, when they look at industrial pursuits, when they look at the massive number of immigrants coming into society, when they look at free labor, they look at that and say, that creates chaos not stability. So Southerners have concluded we've got to have this hierarchy and that that hierarchy is wholly dependent on slavery. If you pull slavery out of this hierarchy, it collapses. Okay? So slavery is possible. Slavery makes all of this possible. Now these two societies, it should be obvious, they are diametrically opposed to one another. So conflict was practically inevitable. In the 1850s, the United States had become convinced that a war was right around the corner because they had become so polarized. In 1850, at the start, it looked like the country had solved its slavery problem by adopting that compromise of 1850, as we talked about in literally the last lecture. But as I also mentioned, the new Fugitive Slave Act that was t tacked onto that wound up blowing the whole thing up. It angered Northerners because they now are convinced that they must 
return, they must re- assist in the return of runaway slaves, which makes them complicit as they see it. They're complicit in slavery. Now, that's how they see it. But here's the reality of things. The North had always been complicit. It's not that now they're complicit. They had always been complicit in slavery. Three-fourths of the exports in this country at this moment, three-fourths of the exports are tied directly to slavery. Investments in many northern industries came from the profits of slaveholders, either slavery themselves, people who owned a number of slaves, or people who were involved in the slave trade, or the planters, or some connection to slavery. So North northerners were always part of this. The North was always part of the system. They just didn't see it that way until the 1850s. Now, as I mentioned when I talked about the Know Nothing Party, politicians really don't like divisive issues. That's why, generally speaking, uh, and the last few years have been, again, a challenge to that, typically the fringe elements of the two-party system fights out these divisive things, the issues that could truly tear apart the country. The the fringe elements fight all of this while the center winds up holding everything together. They compromise everything away. That's why for a long time people always argued when you govern, when you're a president, whether you're a senator, whatever, you govern, quote unquote, from the center, not from the fringes of the country. Uh, However, and, and the reason for that is simple. Divisive issues, by definition, pull things apart. So people were saying, you cannot focus on the divisive issues because they will destroy us. So we let them, we let those fringes deal with them. What we really need to do is focus on the things that either either focus on those things that will keep us together or divert attention so that people are not thinking about those divisive issues. So how do we divert attention? Well, one way, very simple, is to turn our attention overseas. And American politicians during this era consciously divert attention to places in Asia. In addition to what I've talked about with China, one place that the U.S. desperately wanted to open to trade was Japan. Japan, for decades had refused any Western involvement. And finally, in 1851, the United States wound up sending a fleet of gunboats under Commodore Matthew C. Perry. Uh, And essentially at gunpoint, Perry and his fleet opened Japan and its ports to American trade. Now, the result was that Japan, like China, is forced to accept Western trade goods and Western influence. But that's where the similarities end. Okay. There's a complete difference when it comes to China, excuse me, to Japan. Japan takes a different course than China. Their stance is don't get mad, get even. After this forcing of Japan to open its doors to trade, Japan begins to embrace industrialization as opposed to agricultural pursuits, just like the West was doing. They embrace militarism, just like the West. And indeed, Japan becomes the only non-Western power to industrialize during the 19th century. Japan very quickly turns itself into an industrial and military power, and as a result, they're able to resist the type of exploitation and subjugation that China was forced to endure. to the point that in 1905, they beat up the Russian Empire badly uh, in, in, in that decade. They uh, wind up being a key player uh, in World War I, which happens during the 19-teens. So this industrialization and militar- militarization is rapid from, a, from the standpoint of a, uh, of a timeline. Now, another area where Americans turn their attention is to Hawaii. Uh, Hawaii is, again, uh, the idea, open it up to U.S. influence. Now, Hawaii is an independent nation at this point. It is not a territory of any particular uh, 
Western government. It's not under the colonial rule of anybody. Hawaii is an independent kingdom during this period. But in the 1850s, American businessmen, including the Dole family, uh, begin going into Hawaii with the idea of opening sugar plantations and pineapple plantations there. Now, when these people go, and they say flat out, look, we're opening sugar plantations. We've seen this play out before, okay, in the Caribbean, lots of sugar plantations. So the question was, okay, if you're going to go open sugar plantations, how are you going to do that? What kind of labor are you going to use? And these businessmen flat out said, we are not going to use slavery. You can trust us. Slavery will not be brought into Hawaii. And they don't use slave labor. Well, sort of, they don't. Instead, what they employ is a system of labor called coolie labor, C-O-U-L-E-E, -E, coolie labor. Now, Westerners had developed this system of labor in Chile, where natives uh, were employed uh, to go into caves and collect bat dung for use as fuel. Uh, coolie labor literally means contract labor. But under this system, the wages are not paid to the laborer. This is why it's not free labor. Okay, Under this system, the wages are not paid to the employee. Rather, they are paid to a third-party agent. Okay, And then that agent deducts the cost of living, the cost of room and board, the cost of transportation, etc. They deduct that from the pay and then give the remainder of the pay to the laborer. Now, this was a very ugly system of coerced labor. It's an incredibly uh, ugly, it's an incredibly ugly and, as it turns out, very dangerous system. In Chile, the life expectancy upon entering the coolie labor system was about six months, and people attributed that to going into these caves where they're collecting bat dung and breathing in nitrates and all of that and saying, well, that's what killed them. It wasn't the work itself. It's the sort of external surroundings. The problem was is that in Hawaii, we see the same exact circumstances. People being brought into labor in Hawaii. They're coming in from places like South America. They're being brought in from Japan in large and larger and large larger numbers and these people are going to work in this system and they are going to be again worked to death the life expectancy was about 6 months in Hawaii as well so peculiarity emerges during this period a very strange circumstance emerges northerners are employing wage or free labor at home but in the so-called third world they are using coerced labor. Between Chile, Hawaii, and other places that U.S. investors went, they employed somewhere between 2.5 and, and 3 million coerced laborers like the Cooley labor system. If we were to compare that to the system of slavery, it's just a few short of the number of slaves. If we're comparing 3 million, by the time 1860 rolls around, we've got about 4 million slaves in the United States. So the labor systems, in terms of the numbers of people involved, are roughly the same. Now, this is not going to be the last time that Northerners will be accused of hypocrisy when it comes to issues like race and labor. Now, the goal of the politicians who are pushing this is about national expansion, saying we need to go abroad to open markets, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But make no mistake about it. The broader goal, yeah, they want expansion. Yes, they want to open marketplaces. The broader goal here is to take people's minds off of the issues of slavery at home. But as always, with these plans that these guys have, those plans wind up blowing up in their faces because they're not able to keep people's minds off of this sort of stuff. Stephen Douglas from Illinois begins to talk about opening up Kansas and Nebraska for settlement. And in 1854, he convinces the Senate to pass the so-called Kansas 
Nebraska Act. Now, what this Kansas and Nebraska Act is going to do is it's going to open up the territories of Kansas and Nebraska to white settlement. So specifically, Kansas and Nebraska are open to white settlement. He also proposes that in both places, when it comes to dealing with, quote, the slavery question, they will use the technique of popular sovereignty. Just like when we talked about the Compromise of 1850, all those Western territories are going to use popular sovereignty. Douglas says, let's use it here as well, since it seemed to work out so well out West. Let's use popular sovereignty here. But both of these things that Douglas is proposing are a problem. First, Kansas and Nebraska, I'm going to use yellow here, are right in the middle of the Louisiana Purchase Territory. Now, for those of you who remember stuff from the second module and haven't just gone, get out of here. All of this stuff about the Louisiana Purchase Territory had already been settled by the Missouri Compromise and that 3630 line. Both Kansas and Nebraska are above the 3630 line, so it should never have been an issue. The other problem here is, is the border with the Mississippi River. The other problem here is, the Mississippi River marks the line between quote unquote white America, if you will, and Native American lands. Jackson, Andrew Jackson's presidential administration, had promised all of that land to Native Americans, quote, in perpetuity. So both of these are a problem. And yet, Douglas pushes forward with it because he believes this is not what people want now. People want more options rather than restricted options on the issue of slavery. So the Kansas and Nebraska Act, while it specifically does those other things, while it specifically opens it up to white settlement, while it specifically puts in popular sovereignty, it also fundamentally destroys the Missouri Compromise. It repeals it. It doesn't say we're repealing the Missouri Compromise, but that's what it functionally does without saying the words we're repealing it. By saying the question will be handled via popular sovereignty, the 3630 Act line, excuse me, the 3630 line is, irre is made irrelevant. Now, the Whigs and the Know Nothings wind up being destroyed again over this stuff because the Whig Party simply doesn't have, uh, they've already, they're clinging to life support as it is at this point. And the Know Nothings, this is kind of the nail in their coffin because they cannot challenge what the Democratic Party uh, is doing with this national expansion, especially when they keep talking about no immigrants, no immigrants, no immigrants. Douglas is saying uh, we're going to need immigrants to come out here and settle all of this stuff. So the no nothings are gone. The Democratic Party, though, they suffer as a result of this. The Northern Democrats are furious over this stuff because they look at that getting rid of the 3630 line and say, this is a terrible idea. We're going to lose out as a consequence here. Southerners, as uh, you can probably figure out, are thrilled to death with this because it reopens the question for them. And then the last part of this is that it creates a party with one policy goal, and that one policy goal is stopping the expansion of slavery. And this new political party is the Democratic, excuse me, the Republican Party. And as I mentioned, this Republican Party is the same Republican Party that exists today. So its roots are in stopping the spread of slavery into the Western territories. Now, once again, uh, the question is, why would Douglas do something like this? Because it seemed obvious that Northerners would hate this idea. Uh, Douglas didn't really worry about this. He said, you know, yeah, we're going to do popular sovereignty. But he said, come on, guys. Nobody in Kansas and Nebraska is going to vote 
to bring slaves into Kansas and Nebraska. It's going to be cornfields, and we've already proven corn and slaves don't really work together well uh, because there's too much time sitting around. So we don't. It doesn't work. He said you can't grow cotton here. You can't grow tobacco, rice, indigo. None of those quote cash crops that are used with slaves. So nobody's going to vote to bring slaves here. So it's ir- it's an irrelevant argument. It turns out the reason Douglas did this is Douglas uh, was part of a group of senators who wanted a transcontinental railroad. And there were two proposals for a transcontinental railroad, one that would go through the north. Now, transcontinental railroad would link the Atlantic and the Pacific. Okay, So Douglas is saying we want a transcontinental railroad that goes across the whole country. One proposal was to run it through the north, which would make it go through Chicago, Illinois, and by by extension, go through places like Kansas and Nebraska. Or the other proposal was to go through the South, which Douglas did not want to happen because it would limit the importance of Chicago. So Douglas does all of this as a way of getting it to go through the North and through Chicago. And it turns out that's going to work. That's uh, It's going to work out that way. It does wind up going through the North uh, when it finally gets created. But while Douglas is sitting there thinking, Nobody will ever bring their slaves to Kansas. He's wildly incorrect. And the reason is actually pretty simple. Many people held that popular sovereignty is a reasonable idea, that the people who settle an area determine the laws about slavery for themselves. So when they can think about it, if they sit down and think about it and say, yeah, there's you don't use slavery with these types of industries, but it's not for us to tell somebody they can't have slaves. That's problematic to anti-slavery people. And by saying that the people who settle this area determine the slavery question, what Douglas was really doing was inviting the anti-slavery and the pro-slavery sides to compete over Kansas and Nebraska, and compete not just by sending people who own slaves or don't own slaves, but send people who are willing to cast a vote one way or the other. So a a big umbrella group called the New England Emigrant Society starts organizing amongst all of these anti-slavery and abolition groups. They raise $5 million and say, we're going to finance anybody who is willing to go to Kansas or Nebraska, and who will vote anti-slavery. And a similar group exists in the South, too. Uh, It's not as organized, it's not as centralized as the New England Immigrant Society, but they're funding people to go there and cast, quote, pro-slavery votes. So it's pretty clear there is going to be a fight in Kansas and Nebraska. Now, popular sovereignty, according to the rules, There's going to be a vote. And in 1855, the vote happens. Now, if this doesn't make you think about voter fraud, nothing will make you think of voter fraud. There were 1,500 people registered to vote in Kansas, and somehow 7,000 people cast ballots in that 1855 election. Now, among the 1,500, They were people who, based on location, based on where they'd come from before, they were overwhelmingly people that would be assumed to be anti-slavery. However, the pro-slavery side actually wins the election in this, in Kansas and Nebraska, in, or excuse me, in Kansas in 1855. Now, since they win and win this election, despite all of the elements and fears of voter fraud, they decide We're not going to take any nonsense from these anti-slavery people. They very quickly convene a legislative assembly. I'm not going to call it a uh, a state uh, state House of Representatives because it's not a state, and it's not. It's certainly uh, contested as to who's actually in charge. But they convene a legislative body, and their first act is to pass a law, quote unquote that sentences anyone who speaks out against slavery 
to 10 years at hard labor. Now, the anti-slavery forces don't simply take this. They set up a protest government in Lawrence, Kansas, claiming that there had been widespread election fraud and saying, we do not accept the results of the election. The pro-slavery forces gathered a militia. They go, they marched on Lawrence, Kansas, and they burn it to the ground. And this begins a civil war in Kansas that doesn't end until the United States' civil war begins. Now, that's in Kansas. This whole thing, this whole affair becomes known as, quote-unquote, bloody Kansas. But it's getting bloody everywhere, particularly in the halls of Congress. At the same time that all of this is happening, Congress is debating about what's happening in Kansas and what the proper remedy is for what's going on in Kansas. And a senator from Massachusetts named Charles Sumner gives a two-day speech called, quote, The Crime Against Kansas. Now, this speech was full of double entendres and sexual innuendos about Kansas, about slavery, about Southerners. Sumner ridiculed two Southerners or two senators by name. One of them was a South Carolina senator named Andrew Butler. Now, Butler was absent when the speech uh, was made, and so he didn't hear any of this stuff. But Sumner talked about things like he compared Kansas to, quote-unquote, virgin land, and then said that all of these people who were going in who were trying to, quote, exploit Kansas were doing this uh, in the same manner that a virgin would be raped. So a lot of people hearing this speech were going, oh, my. They couldn't believe that Sumner would say such horrible things. And then with regard to Butler, he compared him and compared his relationship to slavery to that of a prostitute. He says that Butler was, quote, having or was having, quote, an affair with that harlot slavery. Now, the other senator that he mentioned by name, incidentally, was Stephen Douglas. And he mentioned Douglas just in the context of basically saying Douglas is stupid. Uh, but Douglas just kind of shrugged it off. Douglas, uh, when hearing all of this, said quite literally, quote, that damned fool is going to get himself killed by some other damned fool. As it turns out, Douglas was pretty prophetic about all of this stuff. Now, while Butler was not there, Butler's nephew, a guy named Preston Brooks, was there while Sumner gave this speech. Now, Preston Brooks himself was actually a member of the House of Representatives from South Carolina, and he heard all of this stuff, and believing this to be a matter of honor for his family, approached Charles Sumner the day after the speech, walked right up to Sumner, and began beating him with his cane. Now, his cane, Brooks's cane, was a solid hickory cane that, in beating Sumner with it, it split right down the center. Okay, I don't mean it broke in half like, like a pencil, like that. I mean it split right down the center. That's how hard Brooks was beating Sumner with this cane. Now, Sumner gets beaten nearly to death. Sumner is unconscious. He's bloody. He's, he's in very bad condition on the floor of the Senate. And Brooks gets dragged out, and everybody is horrified by this. Even people who are saying, Sumner said a lot of dumb stuff. They were going, but that was way too much. But the House of Representatives was simply unable to pass any sort of disciplinary measures against Brooks. Now, Brooks understood that they're trying to get rid of me. So Brooks just said, fine, you guys don't want me here? I'll resign. And the reason he resigned was he knew that South Carolina would have a, an election to replace him, and that he was the likely vic he would be the likely victor in that election. And surprise, when they hold the election, Brooks doesn't even need to campaign. They vote him in overwhelmingly from his district because South Carolinians 
approved of what he did. And they approved it so much that Brooks or excuse, that Brooks got mailed to him a number of new canes with instructions that read things like, I know which senator you can use this new one against. So Brooks is basically a hero. So he's bulletproof. Nothing can happen to him. Now, one last word about the Kansas and Nebraska Act before we move on. As Kansas was happening, as all this ugly stuff is happening, a man in Massachusetts heard about the sack of Lawrence. His name was John Brown. And John Brown was a Bible-quoting abolitionist who did not believe that he was some sort of you know, reincarnation of Christ or anything like that. But he did believe that he was a messenger from God. And he said, he stood up in the back of a church in Massachusetts and said, and put his hand on a Bible and said, I, I swear that I'm going to commit the rest of my life to stopping slavery everywhere by any means at my disposal. And so what he does is he takes his sons and he moves to Kansas uh, and joins the fight in Kansas uh, and wound up, uh, he and his sons attacked this caravan of Kansas settlers and and killed every single one of them uh, by literally putting them to the sword and cutting them, hacking them up into bits. Now, that's going to take us to our next topic, our closing topic for today. Since violence is beginning to erupt everywhere, and there does not seem to be an answer for it, the Supreme Court is going to jump into this whole thing. The Chief Justice of the Supreme Court is a guy named Roger Taney. And Roger Taney believes, just like people before him, just like Douglas believed before him, just like Clay before that believed, Taney believes that there's a case winding its way through the court system that will allow him to make a single ruling and pff, resolve everything about slavery all at once. Now, given how many times you've heard me say that Clay proposed this compromise, thinking we'll resolve all of the crises at once, and Douglas proposes this, thinking it will resolve all of the crises at once, you can probably guess how well it's going to work out with the Supreme Court going, we've got a case that will allow us to handle all of this all at once. But the case was the Dred Scott case, or as it was styled in the court's uh, paperwork, Dred Scott v. Sanford. Now, Dred Scott was a slave owned by a U.S. military surgeon. Now, as many uh, military officers, not just surgeons, but as many military officers did, uh, this officer moved from post to post uh, as part of his duties. Now, because Scott was, Dred Scott was his, quote, personal slave, Scott moved with him. And as part of the duties, while he was originally enslaved in Missouri, Dred Scott traveled to both Illinois and Wisconsin. Now, this is why I said all of the documents, all of the course material, it all scaffolds. There was a reason I had you read the Northwest Ordinance. Okay, Illinois and Wisconsin were both part of the Northwest Territory. And you should remember that the Northwest Ordinance specifically forbids slavery when it came down to allowing a state to enter the Union from that territory. So, given that Scott had traveled to both Illinois and Wisconsin in the course of his duty, this led Scott to believe something very specific about his status as a slave. And he tested this in 1846 when his owner died and willed Scott to one of his brothers, the Sanford family. In 1846, Scott convinced an abolitionist lawyer to file a lawsuit in the courts in Missouri on the basis that by virtue of being in the Northwest Territory, by virtue of being in both Illinois and Wisconsin, where slavery was prohibited, it erased Scott's enslaved status. And while the initial court ruled against Dred Scott, 
on appeal in the state courts. Scott won. The Missouri courts ordered that Dred Scott be freed. Now, Sanford, the, origi- the, uh, the brother that had been willed Dred Scott, he appealed this case, and it winds up going to the Supreme Court. And remember, Roger Taney wants to make a ruling that will resolve all questions about this forever. And his argument is stunning. His uh, Tani's argument is stunning. He read through the various state constitutions, looked at the Constitution of the United States, the Declaration of Independence, looked at laws in, uh, that governed uh, both enslaved people and free blacks in every single state. And as part of that, he does that as part of his studying up for the ruling. And what he concludes is that the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, the Declaration of Independence, and all of these state documents also back up the proposition that these founding documents of the United States do not apply to blacks in the United States. Whether they are free or enslaved, he declares that African Americans have are not citizens and have and quote have no rights any white man is bound to respect meaning bound by law to respect so he's saying african the documents don't apply free or enslaved african americans are not citizens and because of that they don't have any of these rights now that means right on the face of this because they are not citizens they can't bring a lawsuit and therefore scott's case is out the door. But remember, Tani is talking about ruling on one case and handling everything. So he continues. He is convinced, courtesy of the documents and the precedents that have been set, that Congress does not have the power to ban slaves from a territory. Now, what that means is, is that he's declaring, he is declaring, period. Whether the Kansas and Nebraska Act fundamentally overturned the Missouri Compromise, he says, I am overturning it. I am saying Congress cannot ban slavery from a territory. So one part of the compromise that's been holding the United States together is falling apart. Tani then steps in on popular sovereignty, and he says, the people themselves do not have the power to enact laws that prohibit slavery from a territory. Thus, popular sovereignty is also unconstitutional. Now, the only thing Tani had not said Understand that these two last provisions apply only to territories, not to the states already existing. Tani is saying Congress can't ban slavery in the territories, and the people themselves cannot ban slavery from the territories. And he's taking a very strict sort of property rights position on all of this stuff. But what's also important here is the way Tani has ruled here is taking the most extreme pro-slavery position possible. That's what Tani has done. He has taken the most extreme pro-slavery position possible. The only thing he, the only way he could have made it more extreme was by saying that a state does not have the right to ban slaves from their own state. Now, that would have probably been a step too far, given that a lot of Southerners were states' rights advocates, saying that the states have the right to decide whatever. So it's likely that he was not going to go down that road. However, Abraham Lincoln was not buying that. Abraham Lincoln believed that Taney was actually going to go down that road. He believed 
that there was a, a case in the court system at that moment. And he said, Tani has already ruled this way. I don't think there's much doubt about how Tani will rule going forward. But he continued by saying that this verdict deserves all the respect of any decision made in a D.C. bar room. So he didn't, Abraham Lincoln didn't think very highly of this. But why this course, this case matters, aside from the sad case of Dred Scott, who unfortunately will die of pneumonia before he could ever have been, been freed, uh, he's going to die. So it's not in that. The importance is, is that the United States has been held together by compromises since the 18-teens. And Tani has basically taken those threads and stripped them bare. Okay, The United States is pulling apart at the seams as a result of this ruling. So can these people find another compromise? Are they willing to find another compromise? We'll see in Lecture 18.